Amen. If you'll open your Bibles in the New Testament with me and be turning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, we're going to be studying one of the very familiar stories from the ministry of our Lord, a story that He told in the course of His teaching ministry, one that no doubt you've heard many times before, and so perhaps we will find nothing new there this evening, but I hope at least we will be encouraged and helped by the reminder of familiar truths if we do not peer any further than as far as you might have seen up until this point. If you'll stand with me as you're able, we're going to hear Jesus speak in Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19, but before we do, let's ask God's blessing upon us. Gracious God and Father, it is your word that stands before us and we come together here now seeking it, desiring to hear it, desiring to be taught, not merely by a fallible preacher, for we know that men do err, but we desire to be taught despite man's fallibility by your infallible spirit. And so we pray this night, O God, that the words of my mouth as a preacher and the meditation of all our hearts as your people might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Hear now God's word, Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. This is the word of the Lord. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame." But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead." Congregation, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we said, this is a familiar story, and yet it is a haunting description, one that should, in certain respects, haunt us as we think about the afterlife, as we think about what lies beyond this earthly pilgrimage. The study, uh, the, the story rather, is a study of contrasts and reversals. You see the rich man who lives with this great comfort in life and then experiences great misery and death while the experience of the beggar Lazarus is just the opposite. And maybe I need to say at the outset here, we'll mention this again later on, that this Lazarus is not to be confused with Jesus' friend Lazarus who was raised by the Lord in John chapter 11. Don't let the same name confuse you. This Lazarus is a beggar, whereas Jesus' friend who is called Lazarus in the Gospel of John was apparently a fairly wealthy man. Now the lessons in this story I think are pretty plain. Many of them lie on the surface of the text. They're easy to see. But there are other aspects of the story that can be and have been misunderstood or misrepresented if we only engage in a superficial reading. And so though it is familiar, I want to encourage you tonight to really read this text carefully and to try to contemplate in ways that I hope will be productive for us in, uh, in reviewing this material. The story only appears here in Luke's Gospel. There's no parallel in any of the other three canonical Gospels. In fact, there's nothing like it in any way in any of the other New Testament texts. 
Now, when we come to this part of Luke's gospel, we're not studying through the gospel of Luke right, Luke right now, so you may not uh, immediately recall what the context is, but the context for many people seems to be irrelevant. They, they sort of dismiss this and imagine that this is just simply a, a section in Luke's gospel where he has collected a variety of random uh, units of thought. But I want to suggest that the context is actually very significant. And I want to begin by suggesting four points for you to pay attention to in that regard. First of all, notice that in chapter 16, up in verse 14, the text refers to the Pharisees as lovers of money. And so you have the Pharisees who are lovers of money deriding Jesus, and immediately after you have a story about a man who apparently loved money being put in his proper place. And that does not seem coincidental to me. Secondly, notice that the first half of Luke chapter 16 contains the parable of the unjust steward. And while that may be the most difficult parable to interpret that Jesus told, it very clearly refers, at least in part, to the misuse of money. And that parable concludes and is applied by Jesus in verse 13 in this way. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that application to the first parable in the chapter is very well illustrated in this story that closes the same chapter. The third point is this, the previous chapter, Luke chapter 15, which no doubt is well known to most of you, that previous chapter contains three parables of lost things which culminate in the parable of the lost sons or traditionally known as the parable of the prodigal son. You'll be familiar with that story. Now Matthew Henry in his commentary observes a connection here. He says this, quote, As the parable of the prodigal son set before us the grace of the gospel, which is encouraging to us all, so this story sets before us the wrath to come and is designed for our awakening. And very fast asleep those are in sin that will not be awakened by it." So what Henry is saying is that chapter 15 is is to encourage you to see that the Father seeks to save the lost and rejoices in saving the lost. Chapter 16 is to help you realize you are lost and to awaken from the pig pen where you find yourself and to flee to the Father's house. He says this is a sobering story, but it's meant to shake us up so that we run back to the Father. And then a fourth point from the context, and that is this. In the verses that immediately precede our story tonight, verses 14 to 18, Jesus contrasts what is highly esteemed among men, but is in fact an abomination before God. Let me read those verses with you. In verse 14 of Luke 16, Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided Jesus. And Jesus said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery." Now, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but I do want to suggest a couple of things that I think are significant about those five verses. You'll notice the opposition of the Pharisees. We said they are lovers of money. They're mocking Jesus. They're dismissing what he's teaching because they know in part that that first parable is directed against them. And Jesus says, you know, you're the kind of people that love to vindicate yourselves, that love to justify yourselves, that imagine that you yourselves are righteous. But he says, you need to remember that what men regard highly, God thinks nothing of it at all. The things that are highly esteemed in the eyes of men are an abomination in the sight of God. And he says, what's happening right now is the kingdom of God is being preached and the people of the kingdom are pressing into it. There's violent language being used here. That does find parallels in some of the other Gospels. There's violence in pressing into the kingdom of God. Guess who's not pressing into the kingdom? The Pharisees. Why would they press into the kingdom? They're sure that they already belong to the kingdom. They're sure that the kingdom is theirs. They are the gatekeepers. They have the key. They are righteous people. But Jesus says, you know, there are people in this world that are pressing into that kingdom, streaming into that kingdom, and you are going to find yourselves on the outside of it. Now, what are you seeing in the story tonight? 
You're seeing a rich man who is very self-assured, who is very great in the eyes of this world, who is regarded as nothing in the sight of God. And who is it that makes it into the everlasting kingdom of glory? It's a beggar that, that the rich man thought nothing of in life and yet was thought much of by God. Now that's not all. What does Jesus say next? He says, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. And you say, what in the world does that have to do with anything that we're talking about? What do the Pharisees love to do? They love to monkey around with the law. They love to add to it and ignore parts of it, right? They uh, choose to follow it where they find it convenient to do so and disregard it where they find it inconvenient to do so. And in the very next verse, Jesus makes this odd statement about divorce. Have, has that ever seemed out of place to you? As you're reading Luke's gospel and you think, what is this, a, just a potpourri of Jesus' teachings? Maybe Luke's got this mountain of material. He says, I don't know where to put this. I'm just going to shove it all into chapter 16. I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think these are the random sayings of Christ. I don't think this is the book of Proverbs portion of Jesus' ministry. Now, what is Jesus talking about when he mentions divorce? There's a principle about divorce among human beings. It's perfectly appropriate for us to draw some conclusions in our doctrine of divorce from that passage. But that's not the divorce he's talking about. He's talking about the divorce that Israel's about to experience. He's talking about the divorce that the Pharisees are about to suffer as they come under the curses of the covenant, as they have abandoned their covenant God, the, the one who loved them and, and who, who cherished them, who loved them as a bride, as we see powerfully illustrated in the prophets and especially in the book of Ezekiel. And he says, you are going to be put away. The curses of the covenant are about to fall because the law stands. Regardless of the Pharisees' pride and self-righteousness and wickedness, the law itself stands. And I think here this reference to divorce is an oblique reference to Israel's covenant breaking. And then he gives us this story about someone who enters the kingdom of heaven and someone whom you might have expected to be there who in the end is not. Now what is this story? Is it a parable or is it history? As I was collecting books out of my library this week, I, I love the kind of reading I get to do week to week in terms of studying for lessons and preparing it. But this week, in order to prepare for this material, I had to read my commentaries on the Gospel of Luke, and I had to read from all of the various books that I have on Jesus' parables. That's where all of the discussion was. All of the discussion about this story are in works about Jesus' parables. And it does seem as though the vast majority of preachers and commentators take the story in that way. Now, I deny that categorization. And I, I don't want to make this the focus of our study tonight, but I do think it's important enough that you understand why I deny that categorization and say instead that Jesus is recounting true history. I realize that the applications from the story are going to be largely unchanged whichever way you go on this question, but I don't think it's an unimportant issue, and let me explain why. First, I need you to understand why I take this as historical rather than parabolic or mythological, and I'll give you three reasons. The first reason is this. The story contains two named characters, Lazarus and Abraham. None of the other parables do. No other parable that Jesus tells has a character that is identified by name. Parables are general by definition. They involve a certain man, a farmer, a master, a servant, a father, a son. This is a story about specific people. That doesn't prove for certain that it's not a parable, but it does make it unique among the parables if it were. Second reason is this. This story is an account of an experience and interaction after death. There is nothing like that in any of the rest of the parables. The parables have been described by many people as an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. This would be just the opposite. This would be a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. It simply does not fit the genre. And if it is a parable, we have to decide how literal are we to take its depiction of the afterlife. I think all of us recognize that the way that the Bible speaks about heaven and hell has symbolic language. But how far exactly are we to take that symbolic language? Are we to imagine that there are uh, literal eyes that the rich man lifts in his disembodied state, that he is in literal flame, that there's a literal gulf? Or are we to simply take all of this as metaphorical? How are we to know if this is a parable? And the third reason is this. This story includes at least one historical character we know for a fact, and that is Abraham. Abraham. 
Whoever Lazarus may have been, Abraham is not a character of fiction. And that is why this issue matters. Let me explain. If the story of the rich man and Lazarus is a parable in the sense that it is a fictional story that Jesus created to make a point, then we have a fictional story about Abraham's life in the Bible. And that threatens to upend our doctrine of Scripture. How can we know which purportedly historical stories are actually true? We've got at least one story here, if this is a parable, about Abraham that isn't literally historically true, but it's metaphorically and spiritually true. Well, what about the sacrifice of Isaac? Might that also be a work of of fiction that had been composed to teach a lesson? Might the extraordinary providence of Isaac's birth be ahistorical? I mean, who can believe that Abraham is having children at 100 years old, right? Maybe it's just designed to make a point. And if, in fact, stories from Abraham's life can be non-historical, then what about a lot of the other Old Testament stories? What about the sun standing still in Joshua chapter 10? Whatever that means, maybe it doesn't really refer to anything that happened at all. Or what about the entire story of Jonah? How can you really believe that a prophet was swallowed by a great fish and then vomited up three days later? Can we really believe that there were giants in the land that had to be fought and killed? Or should we simply take them also as a metaphor And while we're on that subject, can we really believe that Adam was made from dust and animated by God, or that Eve was made from his rib? Couldn't we take all of these things simply as parables designed to make a point? And of course, we would answer, no, you can't do that. Obviously, you can't do that, because those stories are presented in Scripture as real history. They name their characters, and they purport to narrate faithfully real events. But I would say... Why then would we take this story in Luke chapter 16 in any other way? It's not introduced as a parable. It's not interpreted as a parable. You say, yeah, but how could history be recounted regarding the afterlife? This is in the mouth of Jesus. Don't you suppose that Jesus knows what happens in heaven and in hell whenever these men may have had this particular exchange? All of us understand that the parable of the sower and the parable of the prodigal son and the parable of the unjust steward are illustrations. But I think the story of the rich man and Lazarus is something more than that. I think it's history, and I think it's an example of voices being heard from the other side of the grave. Well, the story involves two men primarily. Now, Abraham actually has the most speaking time in the story. The story's really not about Abraham, is it? It's about the rich man and Lazarus. One of these remains anonymous, and the other one is acknowledged. Now, when we pay attention to that, that actually becomes the first thing that really becomes significant in interpreting and applying the story. Lazarus is a Latin form of the Hebrew name Eleazar, and that name means God helps. And one of the things that you see in this story is that without telling us that Lazarus is a God-fearing person, Jesus necessarily implies that that was the case. And he implies it in two ways. First of all, he tells us that his name means God helps. And so you're supposed to pick up on the idea that his name is illustrative of his character. The other way that you know that he is a God-fearing man is that he's saved. No one in Scripture is saved because he is poor. No one in Scripture is lost because he's rich. In fact, who is Lazarus united with in the afterlife? It's Abraham. And if you recall, Abraham was a very rich man. But Abraham's saved because he fears God. He trusts God. And clearly implied is the idea that Lazarus also trusted God. The rich man is unnamed. He remains anonymous, and yet this is the one person in the story that would have been known by every one of his contemporaries. Now, traditionally, he's sometimes referred to by the Latin name Dives, but that is not a proper name. That's just simply the word for rich, or in this case, rich man, that appears in the Latin Vulgate. So he's he's Dives because he's the rich man. But the point is, we don't know what his name was, and he's not remembered because he doesn't fear God. This is where you see this first reversal. Here is an an anonymous man who was renowned, no doubt, in his life, and a man who in his life was taken for granted, and yet who is known to God and acknowledged by the saints, even a saint so great as Abraham. Lazarus is remembered, and Lazarus is named because God knows him personally and covenantally. The rich man is forgotten, 
and his memory is left to perish in anonymity because he did not fear God. We continue to talk about this rich man. For the last 2,000 years, the church has recounted his story, and nobody knows his name, and nobody cares because he's lost, because he's in hell, and therefore he is regarded as insignificant. This is, as we said, the first interpretive point that needs to be applied. God remembers his children regardless of what the world thinks about them. Regardless of whether the world knows them or not, God remembers him, and now we cannot forget him. If you had met these two men during their lifetimes, you would have thought that the rich man is the one who would be remembered. He was probably regarded as a very important person. But what death does is it clarifies the truth. And this is what I want you to see. You have heard the idea that death is the great equalizer. That's not true. There's nothing equal about the experience of these two men in their death, right? Death, in this case, reverses their fortunes, but in doing so, it only shows us what was always true. The rich man does not become insignificant when he dies. We simply realize in his death how insignificant he had been all along. Lazarus does not become important in his death. It's only in his death that we suddenly realize how important he was to God all along. That's what death does. It clarifies the truth. It clarifies the reality. You are going to see some very impressive people by the world standards gathered together on the day of judgment who are going to be remembered as nothing. That rich man. Yeah, but do you realize who that is? He was a fabul fabulously rich man. He was on the cover of magazines. He was interviewed on the news. Everyone knew his name. Everyone looked up to him. Yeah, here he's just a rich man who is going to be tormented in hell. And yet those who are God's children, it doesn't matter if anybody knew their names in this life, everyone will know their names in the afterlife because God knew their name all along. Well, what about the experience of men, these men then during their earthly lifetimes? Well, they could not have been more different. The rich man wears purple and fine linen. These are very expensive garments. He feasted sumptuously every day. I don't think it's a coincidence that the rich man is described in the very same terms that would have characterized the garb of the chief priests in Jesus' day. And the presence of the Pharisees in this context make me think that that is an intentional uh, comparison that the Lord is making. By contrast, Lazarus's physical circumstances were absolutely miserable. His body was full of sores. He was laid or, or literally cast at the rich man's gates every day. And if you think about the implication of that terminology, he doesn't go to the rich man's gate every day. He's laid there. He's cast there. Maybe he is physically disabled. Maybe he has such aggravated weakness that he's largely incapacitated. He can't do anything. Maybe he is lame, but he is laid at the rich man's doorstep and he can simply lie there and beg every day. Just as the younger son in the previous chapter had longed in the, in the fields to eat the pig's food, so Lazarus, same verb, longs to satisfy his hunger with only crumbs from the rich man's table. And yet it seems as though, like the rebellious son, Lazarus also goes hungry. In fact, there's no indication in the story that the rich man ever paid him any attention. The only thing that Jesus mentions is that the dogs would come and lick his sores. But even that is a little bit ambiguous, and so commentators are not sure what to do with it. Uh, it it's, in, it's indicating that his physical state is truly pathetic. He has no help. He has no relief. Whether you see the dogs coming and licking the sores as, as kind of exacerbating his suffering or as the one relief that he has in suffering, the point is he has no one who is there to ease his suffering. It is a picture of helplessness. Now Lazarus is not praised in this story for being poor. And the rich man is not condemned for being wealthy. As we said, when Lazarus dies, he goes to be with Abraham, who was fantastically wealthy. Their financial conditions here are illustrative, not determinative. Neither wealth nor poverty commends a person to God. What matters is the fear of God and faith in God. 
And all else being equal, we would rather be a God-fearing rich man than a God-fearing beggar who gets laid at the rich man's gate. We, we would prefer that outcome. But the point is, this, this doesn't really matter to God. The, the size of your bank account, the, the you know, health and, and, and stability of your investment portfolio, whether you own your house free and clear or not, whether you drive a new car, this doesn't matter to God. It, it doesn't make you more or less spiritual for that not to be true. Sometimes I think Christians almost take pride in financial problems as, as if that makes them more spiritual. It doesn't. God just doesn't care. Now, he cares about stewardship, but he doesn't care about the outcome of that stewardship, whether it is great or small. But one thing we do need to be aware of, the Bible warns us about a desire to be rich. Riches are not wrong, but a desire to be rich is itself a snare for the human heart. Listen to Paul's caution in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They're self-inflicted injuries. Did you see that? They pierce themselves with many sorrows that they didn't have to experience. Again, the money is not the issue. It's the fixation upon wealth. It's the desire to be rich. It's making of that money an idol. You need to know God doesn't care whether you have much or little. He cares about your attitude toward Him. There's no fault in being rich. There's nothing wrong in working hard and saving money and having material resources. In fact, there are many things that are right and good about this. It's good. It's a blessing from God. If you are blessed with some measure of wealth, don't feel ashamed of that. right? Don't feel inferior because of that. Thank God for the blessings that he has given to you. But recognize there are dangers. Recognize that there are temptations associated with both wealth and poverty. There is a very real fault in making material wealth your desire and your goal. We need a larger perspective than that. Proverbs warns us, Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5, do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. He says, you are supposed to have enough understanding as a God-fearing person to know that, yes, I need to work hard. Yes, I need to spend less than I make. Yes, I need to take care of my fields first before my house. But... I don't need to wear myself out trying to become wealthy. Because wealth is no more security than any other material resource that I might have. My security is ultimately in the Lord. So yes, I'll work hard. Yes, I'll save. Yes, I'll invest. Yes, I'll plan for the future. But I'll ultimately trust God. Because of the understanding that I have, the larger biblical perspective that I have, I will not wear myself out trying to gain money. Proverbs 28 and verse 6, Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, though he be rich. And Proverbs 22 and verse 2, The rich and the poor have this in common. Yahweh is the maker of them all. If you're poor, God made you poor. If you're rich, God made you rich. Now there's nothing wrong if you're poor to work hard and try not to be poor. That's perfectly fine. Maybe that's why God made you poor is so that you could work hard and gain something for yourself. If you're rich, you don't have to feel ashamed of that. You don't have to be embarrassed by that. God made you rich. But maybe God made you rich so that you could help make others rich and care for those who have fewer resources than you have. The Lord is the maker of every person, and he has called you to faithfulness wherever you may find yourself. The rich man's sin in this story is not explicitly identified, but the implication of the story is that his neglect of Lazarus is a disregard for God. That's the implication, is that you can know how the rich man thinks about God based on the way that he treats, or not, the beggar at his door. Now, how can we say that? Well, I want you to notice the way that the Bible associates love for one's neighbor with love for the Lord. Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The rich man is evidently not observing that second command. And the implication is you can know that he's not keeping the first commandment either by his disregard of the second. Or James, in James chapter 2, at the beginning of the chapter, he says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Making these distinctions, showing favoritism to a man because of his material wealth or disregarding a man because of his lack thereof is taken by James as an indication of one's commitment to God. And he says these kind of distinctions which amount to favoritism or partiality make one considered a transgressor of the law. John in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's a rhetorical question. It doesn't abide in him. He doesn't have the love of God because he doesn't care about his brother. Or in the next chapter, 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so that's the implication. You don't know much about either of these men in their life. You don't hear about Lazarus' church attendance. You don't hear about his personal expression of faith. You don't hear about the rich man's immorality and carousing and, and, and things of that sort. But you are supposed to be able to figure out from the rich man's disregard of Lazarus that he doesn't love God and that the love of God does not abide in him. Now you immediately want me probably to offer some qualifications to this and I have to do so in order to be consistent with biblical law and wisdom. For example, you want me to remind you that Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 that if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. There is a big difference between helping a helpless man like Lazarus and handing out money to able-bodied junkies at intersections, which we have no shortage of opportunities to do here in Arizona. And I would tell you that you need to do the former, help helpless men like Lazarus, and stop doing the latter, handing out cash to able-bodied junkies at intersections. That is not consistent with biblical law or wisdom. No one is saved by being poor, and no one is saved by being generous. Saved people will be generous, but not all generous people will be saved. Do you understand that distinction, right? A saved person will be generous because the love of God abides in his heart. But just because someone is generous doesn't necessarily mean that the love of God abides in his heart. Bill Gates is reported to have given $45.5 billion to charity. It won't do his soul any good if he doesn't trust in Jesus Christ. I don't know anything about the state of his soul. I'm not trying to pass judgment on him. I'm just saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much you give or how much you don't give. What ultimately matters is whether a person trusts in the Lord. But here is a real danger. When we talk about generosity, when we talk about helping the poor, there is a danger that we completely exempt ourselves from any meaningful responsibility to do good by all of these qualifications. So that we've offered qualification after qualification after qualification, so at the end of the day we don't really have to do anything. But let's think again about how callous this rich man was and the duty that we have to do good as we are able. Lazarus is considered this rich man's brother. So when you're reading in the book of Proverbs, when you're reading in John's first epistle about the duty to your brother, this qualifies, this relationship qualifies. Why? Because both the rich man and Lazarus are Jews. They belong to the covenant And after death, the rich man knows Lazarus' name and recognizes Abraham and calls him father. That's a dead giveaway. You say, oh, you did know he was outside, didn't you? You did know about his physical condition. You knew his first name. You just didn't care anything about him. And now you can appeal to Abraham, so you think, on the basis of some kind of shared ethnic or covenantal identity... Lazarus was not simply an anonymous person on the sidewalk to this rich man. He was a fellow Israelite whom the rich man knew but ignored. 
That's different. We have an explicit responsibility to our fellow Christians, to our brethren, and that goes above and beyond the general duty that we have good, you know, a duty to, to do good to others. You, you see so many needy people in our community, and it's just overwhelming at times. I know because many of you ask me about these kinds of things pretty regularly. In, in fact, some uh, uh, prominent characters in our immediate vicinity that we all see pretty regularly. What, what, what can we do for these kind of people? Uh, well, there's, there are a few things, but, but in a lot of cases, there's not anything that we know we can do. There's a general duty to do good to all men as we have opportunity. But when you have a brother at your gates who is in need, you have an explicit responsibility. And that's what this rich man was disregarding, and you and I dare not disregard. Let me share several passages on this point. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. There is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Christians spend their money in all kinds of ungodly, irresponsible, worldly ways. They just fritter away the blessings of God on all kinds of foolish things. But you know what those foolish things do not include? Doing good to your brethren. Showing kindness to those who are in need. Proverbs says you want to prosper, that's where you invest your money. <laughs> it's, not, it's not in index funds, it's not in mutual funds, it's not in ethically sourced hedge funds. The, the, the way you prosper is you scatter seed in the name of Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of God, among the people of God. Proverbs 14, verse 21, He who despises his neighbor sins, but he who has mercy on the poor, happy is he. You want to be blessed? You want to be happy? You want to have more joy in your life? Don't be so tight-fisted. Do good to the beggar at your gates. Proverbs 19, verse 17, He who has pity on the poor lends to Yahweh, and he will pay back what he has been given. Wow. What does Jesus say in Matthew chapter 25, that great scene at the final judgment? He says, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. Who is he talking about, by the way? We miss this all the time. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren. He's not talking about the stranger on the street. If you could do something for the stranger on the street, by all means do so. But that's not who Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25. He's talking about the brother at your gate, and that is the person that the rich man disregarded. Proverbs 21 and verse 13, whoever shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Proverbs 28 and verse 27, he who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes will have many curses. And Jesus, or Paul rather says in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, therefore as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well, now, what happens when these two men die in the story? Well, as we said, death brought about a complete reversal of their fortunes in life. When Lazarus dies, the angels come and carry him away to be with Abraham. Isn't that an awesome thought? Are you thinking about brothers and sisters in Christ that you know have died in Christ and to imagine them being escorted into heaven by the angels of God? who are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Are you going to just like spiritualize that point and say, what, well, probably doesn't literally mean that the angels come? Okay, well, I mean, you could believe that if you want to. That's fine. But the Bible says that the angels came and carried Lazarus to be with Abraham. That's a beautiful, comforting thought. Being comforted in Abraham's bosom may indicate that Abraham is giving him a hug. Of course, they're both disembodied at this point. So again, admittedly, there's some symbolic language here. We don't know exactly what this means. Maybe the language is only analogical, but it would describe the comfort of fellowship. They are together, right? Chest to chest, as it were. Brother to brother. Arm in arm, as it were. Whether they're disembodied or not. There's comfort in fellowship and relationship. Remember that Lazarus, in his earthly life, was all alone. He had dogs showing up to lick his wounds. But he's not alone in death. He's surrounded in death. He's comforted in death. He's with the people of God. He's with the servants of God. By contrast, the rich man dies and was buried. And you think, boy, Luke, could you flesh that out a little bit? Nope. He died and he was buried. The end. Well, he might have wished that it was the end. We don't know anything about his funeral or his burial. It might have been very impressive from an earthly perspective. 
You think about famous people who die in our country, powerful men, politicians, great men, and the way that we honor them in their death. But what's really happened? If they're not trusting in Christ, they died, they were buried. And all of the pomp and circumstance that follows their death and burial means nothing to God and nothing in light of eternity. It was not even worthy to remark upon in this case. It wasn't, there wasn't any point in Luke recording it. We can assume that in his earthly life, this rich man's wealth had gained him many friends and opportunities, but in death he finds himself alone. Rather than comfort and fellowship with Abraham, as Lazarus experienced, the rich man finds himself in torment, experiencing miserable agony in flame. He's the one who mentions it, not me. It's right there in your text. The rich man sees Abraham and Lazarus a long way off. He can see them, but he cannot reach them. And this is where some commentators will say, well, obviously this can't be hell because they wouldn't be able to see each other. Just say you need to keep reading your Bible and get a little further into the New Testament. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 10 says that the damned will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There's nothing inconsistent in Luke chapter 16 with what is portrayed elsewhere in Scripture. Other people will say, well, this is only figurative. And again, I think there's obviously symbolic language here. I don't know how a disembodied spirit lifts up his eyes. I don't know exactly with, with what he feels <laughs> a flame. I'm not suggesting that every one of these expressions needs to be taken in a hyper-literalistic fashion, but I would wonder how those preachers and commentators know so confidently what in the passage is figurative and what is not. Maybe we should just be content with the story as it stands. The rich man begged for Lazarus to be sent to cool his tongue with water. And what's interesting is what he asks for and what he doesn't ask for. He doesn't beg for mercy. He doesn't acknowledge his guilt. He does not ask for forgiveness. He does not apologize to Lazarus. He does not cry out to God. He asks Abraham to make Lazarus do something for him. The point is that the rich man is miserable, but not repentant. And this is exactly what Scripture tells us about the condemned. Judgment does not make damned people humble or penitent. There are no repentant sinners in hell. All of the repentant sinners are in heaven. The rich man does, does show some concern for someone other than himself. He shows concern for his five brothers. But then when Abraham is not willing to go along with what he asks to be done, he's, well, so, well, if you can't send Lazarus over here, then send him to my house. Tell my, tell my brothers, to my father's house, set, tell my five brothers not to come here. And Abraham says, no, we can't do that. They, they have the scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets. He argues with Abraham. Does that sound like a repentant person? No, Father Abraham, you're, you're wrong, Abraham. If they, they won't believe the scriptures, but if someone comes back from the dead, they'll believe him. And Abraham says, no, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even though one rise from the dead. And don't miss the irony of whose mouth that is coming out of. Jesus is the one who comes back from the dead. We'll come back to that point in just a minute. Death changed their circumstances. It did not change their character. The rich man was still just who he had always been, and presumably Lazarus was as well. We don't know a lot about Lazarus because he never speaks in the story. We only know what is implied. But we know who the rich man is from his conversation with Abraham and from what is implied prior to his death. Judgment does not change who and what we are. It only reveals and confirms it. And that is true of individuals when they are judged by God. That's true of churches when they're judged by God. That's true of nations when they're judged by God. That's what you're seeing right now. If you're looking around and saying, what in the world happened to America? It seems like just a few years ago we were just a great God-fearing place. Well, <laughs> guess not. Right? Judgment doesn't change character. It doesn't change essential nature. The only thing that can change nature is grace. The only thing that can change character is the gospel, the work of the Spirit. Judgment reveals and confirms. It can make, make us more of what we are. It can't make us other than what we are. And so the identity and the trajectory of these two men doesn't change. 
They just become more of what they always were. Lazarus was a worshiper of God, always destined for joy and glory. Now, if you'd seen him with dogs licking his wounds, lying on the street curb, begging for change, you might not have thought there is a person destined for joy and everlasting glory. But he always was. He always was. God knew him before he made the world. God knew him and named him before he said, let there be light. He was always destined for joy and glory. And the rich man was always destined for hell. If you saw the rich man in his life, you might not have thought, that man is heading for misery. <laughs> this doesn't, we, we don't think there's any misery in the zip code. This man lives in just incredible pleasure, incredible comforts. He was always destined for misery and torment. Both of them got what they aimed at. Both of them finally reached the goals that they had pursued during their life on earth. I want to offer two applications and then the, the lesson is yours tonight. First of all, we need to see in this story the importance of an eternal perspective on our earthly circumstances. Lazarus' life really did seem miserable, and the rich man's life really does seem to have been desirable, but who would not gladly accept Lazarus' earthly misery for the sake of his eternal comfort, and who would not gladly refuse the rich man's earthly wealth to avoid his eternal punishment? Do you understand the point? If I said to you, listen, I can promise you that if you will simply endure a few years as a beggar, suffering, hungry, weak, miserable, totally helpless, totally lonely, totally dependent, and after that you will experience an eternity of undiminished joy, would you be willing to do that? Or if I said, I will make you the wealthiest, most powerful, most popular person on the planet, you will be able to have anything that you want. All of your heart's desire throughout all of the years of your earthly pilgrimage and at the end of your life, you are going to go to hell forever. Anybody want to agree to that kind of a contract? The point is this. Your circumstances in this life are never so miserable that eternity with Christ will not more than make up for it. You will not look back from eternity and say, wow, that was really bad. I'm so glad that's over. You won't look back at all in that way. Lazarus isn't. At the same time, your earthly joys can never be so great as to make hell worth it. I don't care how great your life may be. I don't care how much satisfaction you may think that you have. It will not be any comfort to you in hell. And this is why the wise man encourages us in Scripture to think often of death. Meditate on the day of your death. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 2 to 4. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Do you know how many people self-medicate so that they can avoid the pain and misery and hopelessness of their present existence? Biblical wisdom says embrace it. Look it square in the face and recognize that it has no power to harm you. Your misery, your pain, your loneliness, all of your sorrows, all of your adversity are as nothing in comparison to what you have in Christ. Look it square in the face and don't try to numb it. The psalmist says in Psalm 90 and verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You have to know the brevity and frailty of your life to be a wise person according to Scripture. Or in the New Testament, James says in James chapter 4, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Worldly people don't like to think about death. 
but godly, wise people will do so. One day you are going to die just like these two men did. And you will enter either into everlasting comfort or torment. And the question is, which will it be? How will you live today in view of that reality? We're constantly in discipling and mentoring young men in this church, telling them, think about where you want to be in 10 years, what kind of person do you want to be, and work backward from that and decide what you need to do today to get there. We do that all the time. We have that conversation all the time. Okay, think a step beyond that. Think about where you're going to spend eternity. Now think backwards from there and figure out what you need to do today in view of that reality. How might thinking about your death change your attitude your outlook, your priorities, and the way that you spend your life. When he was a young man, Jonathan Edwards made many resolutions that he committed to reading at least once a week for the remainder of his life. Here are a few that are relevant. Resolved to live with all my might while I do live. Resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. Resolve that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. Resolve to live so at all times as I think is best in my devout frames and when I have clearest notions of things of the gospel and another world. Resolved I will act so as I think I shall judge would have been best and most prudent when I come into the future world. Resolve that I will act so in every respect as I think I shall wish I had done if I should at last be damned. I frequently hear persons in old age say how they would live if they were to live their lives over again. Resolved that I will live just so as I can think I shall wish I had done, supposing I live to old age. Those are worth meditating upon. Thinking of death and eternity also helps us rightly estimate our, lo- our wealth in this life. Because who was truly rich in this story? Do you understand the point? It was not the rich man who was rich. It was Lazarus who was in a blessed or happy state. It wasn't the rich man. It was Lazarus. Jesus said to the saints in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. What would he say to us? Would he say, I know how little you have from this world's perspective in money and material goods and health and respect, but you are rich. We need to think about our death. Not so as to become discouraged, but to become more cheerful and hopeful. I'm not recommending morbid introspection. I'm recommending healthy, cheerful, robust meditation upon the reality of our death. And finally, this point. There is a sobering reality that it confronts us here that hell is real and Christ is the only hope that we have of escape. And I would be remiss if I did not point this out. We see here the terrifying threat of going to torment if one does not flee to Jesus Christ. There is in this story, very explicitly, no post-mortem opportunity for salvation. There is no relief. You cannot have Lazarus dip his finger in water and cool your tongue. You cannot have a second chance. You cannot come back and speak to your family or live your life over. There is only unending misery. The rich man was sure that his brothers would repent if they knew of his plight, but you do know of his plight. Don't wait until you are there to decide that you don't want to be there. Christ is our only hope. His blood and righteousness is our only salvation. His mercy alone is our comfort and our peace. The Jews would refer to their scriptures by this reference that Moses, or that Abraham rather uses. He says they have Moses and the prophets. They have the law and the prophets. The law, the writings, and the prophets were the three parts of the Hebrew Bible. They say the law, the law and the prophets or Moses and the prophets. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man says, no, no, no. They, they won't listen to the Bible. They won't listen to Scripture. But they would listen to someone who has a dramatic experience. And Abraham says, that's not true. That's not true. And again, the irony of Jesus saying this as the one who would come back from death itself, to proclaim life. But do you understand that by his resurrection, Jesus does not convince anyone who would not be convinced by God's word? Do you understand that? He dies and rises to secure salvation. 
But he will not, by his resurrection, convince anyone that would not be convinced by Scripture because it is the Spirit that has to change the heart. Do not perish like the rich man. Fear God, number your days, cling to Christ as your true wealth and hope of glory. Do not be discouraged even though you suffer greatly. Your woes are not as great as Lazarus's, and even if they were, consider how greatly death changed his fortune. The Word of God says the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that awaits. So look forward in hope, live for Christ, and be content where you are with what you have, knowing that you are destined for joy. Amen. Let's bow together. Gracious God and Father, we want to enter into that glory, that perfect and eternal rest. O oh Lord, to depart and be with Christ is a far, far better thing. You have called us to faithfulness here in this earthly life as pilgrims and sojourners. We pray for grace to be faithful. Keep the cross before our eyes. Keep eternity in our hearts. Help our hearts to be improved by meditating upon the certainty of death and help our minds to be filled with hope and courage and good cheer each day as we meditate upon eternal life. Bless us as we return to our homes, we pray in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.